Welcome back. Today we're talking about bottle packaging. Alright, so glass bottles. They are definitely one of the most recognizable packages available. When you think of like uh, generic beer pictures on memes or icons or anything like that, you're most often going to see a brown glass bottle. Uh, it is just part and parcel become to become it's, it's iconic. Most of what you look at a brown glass bottle, you're going to think in your head it's a beer bottle. And you're not going to really think of anything else. Uh, glass bottles themselves, they're sturdy, they're easy to work with. Uh, the chemistry behind glass makes them non-reactive. You, know, you don't have to worry about having a liner inside of a glass bottle like you do with a can because glass as far as our product is concerned, is inert, it's non-reactive to beer. So it does not change the quality of our product as we put it inside of it. Uh, glass bottles are created by glass blowing. Uh, and that process has become mechanized over the years. There's no longer a human blowing into it like a long time ago, or with like a custom vase or something like that, made out of glass. It is a mechanical process, but it is still the same concept behind it is you've got molten glass fit into a form and then blown into place. It's a single piece of glass blown into shape. Uh, it's capped with a metal crown and that's going to be coated with a sealant material of some sort, usually a plastic of some sort except for swing top or uh, growlers. They're going to be uh, kept differently, of course. A crown is crimped onto the bottle to create a seal. So when you think about a crown or a bottle cap, there are usually the ridges that go around the outside, and those are crimped around a top uh, bulging part of the glass to create that, that holding spot or that, that crimp and holding onto that particular spot of the glass. Uh, sizes of Glass beer bottles can range from 11 ounce stubbies to 64 ounce growlers. And we can see here, you've got this little guy here, uh, and then you've got your, your 12 ounce heritage glass, are very common, and then the 12 ounce long necked, uh, the fancy glass bottle. Uh, 22 ounce bottle, and then you get into your growlers that are uh, screw top, and 32 ounce mini growler or howler, and a 64 ounce growler, which is a half gallon. Something that I didn't include here is uh, specialty things like champagne bottles that are going to be probably green or clear, uh, and larger like magnum champagne bottles, things like that. Uh, not super common, but uh, it's possible for us to package into. Uh, swing top bottles, we kind of mentioned that before, uh, also known as a Grosch bottle. They were popularized by a Grosch beer. Grosch beer. Uh, there is a ceramic or a plastic seal, it's not even really a seal, it's a, yeah, it's a stopper, yeah, a ceramic or plastic stopper. The old Grolsch bottles were ceramic, uh, the newer versions of the swing tops are plastic, uh, and they're on a metal swinging frame, so you swing up around and then you clamp them down, it creates that seal with a rubber gasket that goes around that ceramic or plastic. Uh, they're pricey, uh, just because it takes a lot of money to shape that glass and then you've got the added expense of the, the wire metal frame and then the uh, stopper and the gasket. Uh, and typically these are going to be reusable. Uh, they're not typically single use, throwaway type thing. Here's a picture of them. This is a, uh, a newer version. You can see this is actually a plastic. Uh, but the idea is, is basically the same. You've got a, a easily reusable packaging system, just occasionally you have to replace the rubber gasket. Uh, holds a, a fair amount of pressure, we don't have any issues there. Glass colors. Uh, this this will see a little contention. Uh, clear glass is the worst possible decision you can make to package your beer into. Uh, unless you're using a UV stable hop product Clear glass offers zero protection against UV light, and we learned in sensory evaluation that UV light uh, interacts with the hop compound to form MBT. MBT smells like skunk butt. 
So clear bottles are the worst thing you could possibly put beer into. Uh, unless you're using a UV stable hop product and uh, not many people do that. They're, the list of breweries that do that is very short. Uh, green is better than clear but it still does allow a significant amount of UV light penetration. That's why a lot of the green bottles that you'll have are skunky. Uh, think about beers that are known for their skunky flavor, uh, Heineken, Rolling Rock, they're all green bottles. Uh, why they've made that decision, I don't know. It just seems like a silly decision. Uh, if you've ever had a Pilsner Urkel from a green bottle, it is awful. If you have Pilsner Urkel from a can or draft, it's the best beer in the world, by far. Uh, brown is the best you can get uh, in glass, aside from like a painted black glass bottle. Uh, offers the best UV protection of all of the available colors, but it still does uh, allow some UV light to get through, so you want to do your best to avoid uh, UV light exposure. Also, some breweries have gone and packaged or created their six-pack holding packages to have a higher uh, end, so that helps block uh, some more exposure to UV light by having that cardboard come up a little higher on that bottle. Uh, of course, if you package your bottles inside of a cardboard, uh, completely enclosed package, that really does eliminate a fair amount of any kind of UV exposure uh, post-packaging. But up to that point, there's still a possibility of UV exposure. And then crowns, so we got a bottle, we filled it, uh, we're about to top it, we need to seal it up. So we're going to put a metal crown on there, and then that crown is going to be crimped around that first bulging edge of the top of that glass bottle. Uh, so you've got a metal crown that's going to be coated with a plastic material that crimps around the top of the bottle. Uh, some of these coatings have some interesting properties. Uh, there are some that have oxygen scavenging capabilities, so that's going to help reduce, not eliminate, but reduce your potential uh, dissolved oxygen into your product. Uh, and there are many different colors that can be customized. They can be real fun. They can be collector's items. I know of a, a certain macro lager that has uh, basically playing cards kind of printed in on the inside of their cap and uh, provides a opportunity for people to collect their bottle caps. Uh, I think you can kind, of, kind of see that as encouraging drinking, but you know, whatever. Um, it, it's, it's a point, it's an additional branding point. Um, there are pry off where you need a bottle opener or a hard edge on a table, and there are twist off. Uh, most of your macro loggers are going to be twist off crimped. Uh, and there are also aluminum twist, where it's got like a, an, a wholly aluminum part to the top, and you break that seal, you twist it off. Uh, very similar, you just don't have to basically pry it off by any means. Here you got a, a standard gold crown, uh, and these uh, dimpled edges are what get crimped around that bulge, that first bulge on the, on the bottle. that creates that seal. Uh, some alternate capping that we see, uh, cork and cage, we see this for highly carbonated beers, specialty beers like Belgian beers. Uh, what you've got basically is a cork that is pushed down into the top of your bottle and then you get a wireframe cage that is uh, twisted shut around it to help hold that cork in. Now that cork is going to be held in by the cork being just large enough to really fit in there but the cage just kind of makes it look prettier. Gives a, an additional branding opportunity on top of that, that cage. Uh, and then also, some breweries also do some wax sealing on top of their crowns. Uh, and the idea is that it may help prevent some oxygen ingress on beers that are recommended to be aged for significant periods of time. Uh, it's also just a gimmick. It's a packaging gimmick. And you think of uh, this bottle's waxed, people, people latch onto it thinking it increases quality. Or, and it, it's just a, it can really only be a gimmick. It doesn't really do much of anything. Uh, if you don't want it to. Bottle conditioning. So we talked about this as one of the methods for carbonating your beer. So carbonating in the bottle, so we've got either wort or sugar added before capping, uh, or 
a, an additional or secondary fermentation or a re-fermentation occurs in that bottle and that produces that natural carbonation. Uh, so to do that, you've got a certain amount of headspace there. That initial pressure created by that excess CO2 has to go somewhere. So in that headspace, that pressure can become significant, sometimes up to 45 PSI. So that bottle cap has to be able to withstand that amount of pressure without popping off. Uh, and sometimes if there is an issue adding a certain amount of sugar, the correct amount of sugar, mixing in fully your sugar solution into your bulk beer before it's bottled, uh, you can see issues with overcarbonation to the point where you do get some some gushers, some bottle, some popped open up the top. Uh, bottle filling operations, so we'll kind of focus on where it might differ from can filling operations. Uh, the general idea is the same. You've got an open package coming down the line that needs to be cleaned, and then it needs to be purged of carbon dioxide, and then it needs to be filled, it needs to be sealed. Uh, the general premise behind it is exactly the same as canning. Uh, the specific is where we really run into differences. Uh, generally, bottles, they're going to come, they could be cleaner or dirtier, depending on where you get your bottles. Uh, they could come on a pallet, they could come uh, boxed individually in cases. It all depends on how many you're ordering and how your supplier offers it to you. And in the, a similar fashion as canning, your operations are going to vary significantly from uh, a single handheld bottle filler, known as a beer gun, all the way up to just a line of bottles flying down the line. It's just a complete burr going blur, going through a rotary filler, and then coming out the other side, finished package, and in, in the numbers of hundreds of cases per per minute. So it's it, it can be significant to watch. It's a it's a blur. And we have similar to cans, we have inline fillers, rotary fillers, counter pressure, and atmospheric filling. Um, the inline fillers is exactly similar to a, a simple canning line. You've got a line of, say, four or five bottles. They stop underneath your fill head, they drop down, uh, they get purged, they get filled, and they move on to the capper. Uh, basically, the same as a can filling line. Rotary fillers uh, operate very similar. Uh, they're going to go around a situation and come out the other side and get filled in the meantime and some will cap at the end of that filler and some will move on to a filling station. Uh, there are also counter pressure filling, atmospheric pressure. It's all just what your machine is designed for. Uh, there are advantages, disadvantages of each one, but uh, it just depends on what you've got. Uh, to cap on foam, which is ideally what we want to see, uh, especially with a bottle, we've got uh, a limited, a, a very definite, defined, different space than a can. Uh, so we really want to make sure that we expel that atmosphere that is sucked in when that fill head comes out of that bottle. Uh, so to do that, there are a couple methods by which a bottling line can create that, that foam, that, that, that head. Uh, one is called a knock foamer, where right as uh, the beer, the filling head is coming out, there is a little metal knocker that gets uh, triggered, cocked by a certain point, and then triggered, and it kicks the bottom of the bottle, and that causes bubbles to rise, and then it expels that atmosphere, and it, that allows you the opportunity to cap on top of foam. Uh, jet foamer, there is a spot right after the filling line where a very fine high pressure jet of water is injected into the bottle which causes that foaming. Uh, very minute amount does not dilute the beer whatsoever, but still I would imagine that's going to be a sterile filtered uh, water. I would not do just straight uh, tap water. And like I said here, step-by-step step can be very similar to can operations with a very significant few differences. Uh, one of them is <laughs> some issues that can arise with uh, bottles. And that is a function of using glass. So 
the most important issue that we're going to see with the bottle filling process is the potential for breakage. <clears throat> Break, broken glass presents a significant health hazard and risk to the customer. Uh, so much so that anybody who packages in glass uh, must have a broken glass log uh, on file with their GMP that is filled out every time a glass is broken on the bottle line or filling procedures. Uh, the brewery must maintain a broken glass log. Uh, and that must include how the incident occurred. So if you have a bottling line, you're going and something breaks, you got to stop. You got to stop everything, investigate how that bottle got broken, uh, figure out how to prevent that from occurring the next time you start up, and then you have to make sure that you clean every aspect of where that bottle was before and after that breakage occurred. Because the last thing you want is a small shard of broken glass getting into a product and causing damage and causing significant issue to customers. That, that is huge. That, that's a huge risk liability to a brewery. Uh, one, so much so, it warrants this uh, broken glass log, be filled out, must be on file, and you have to have a resolution to the issue. Uh, and as that, as that shutdown occurs, every single piece of that bottle filler has got to be cleaned and inspected uh, to make sure that it is free of any kind of glass shards or any, any, any kind of manner whatsoever. Uh, gushers, this is generally going to be an issue with sanitation. Uh, less, if, if your product's not bottle conditioned, sanitation is going to be the likely cause of a gusher. Uh, and, and what that is is significant overcarbonation, either from insufficient mixture of your sugar solution which causes uh, too much sugar to get into your bottle conditioned beer or you have some kind of spoilage bacteria that gets in there and re-ferments any remaining residual sugars that your brewer's yeast couldn't ferment uh, and that's going to lead to significantly higher carbonation levels so as soon as that customer pops that top that carbon dioxide is going to race out of solution and you're going to get your gusher it's going to come right out of there uh, or you can also have some damage in transit so glass while what I said earlier is true, it is a very sturdy uh, packaging material, it's not indestructible. Uh, glass can break, uh, especially with mishandling. So distributors, package delivery operations, uh, sometimes they don't always treat things as nicely as you and I would like them to be treated. Uh, so sometimes bottles break, <clears throat> and that is just unfortunately a reality of the packaging substance. Uh, it, it can be fragile if not handled correctly. Uh, so that's something to think about uh, from an end user standpoint when you're trying to decide glass versus aluminum. Uh, if you're going to be shipping your product, glass also represents a significant increase in shipping weight. Uh, and that's also an issue uh, from the raw material supplier. Uh, so you're ordering a pallet of bottles. The shipping cost of the, that pallet of bottles is going to be much more significant than the shipping cost of a pallet of cans. Uh, the weight of a bottle versus the weight of a can is a significant difference. Alright, thank you.